All right, Miss Yolanda, I believe that you can do your thing. I'm just making sure the live is uh, going. Hold on a second. Please excuse my background noise. Okay, we are live. I'm going to start <clears throat> making people posts. All right, once again, hello everyone and welcome, 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 welcome. We're so happy to have you this evening. We have about 60 seconds and we're going to get this rocking and a rolling. We are officially live via YouTube. And you are the official host. All right. Thank you, ma'am. You are definitely appreciated. Thank you, Yolanda, for all that you do. All right. Should we begin the recording and closed captioning? Yes, ma'am. I am. All right. All right. So hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Lunar and Planetary Institute Space Rock presentation. We call it our VEEPS program, which stands for Virtual Exploration Experiences with Planetary Scientists. My name is Sherelle Webb. I am your public engagement lead at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and I am so thrilled about this special Space Rock event. I also want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to one of our host families, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, wave to everyone. <laughs> We're going to be, and Nathaniel will be engaging with our scientists on this evening. Um, and so if you would like to be promoted, please let us know. And so you can engage with them as well. So again, welcome to our event, everyone. So, you know, our event is things Space rock. So have you ever seen a shooting star? Then you may have seen a meteoroid fall into Earth. Once these space rocks land, scientists call them meteorites. Meteorites come in different shapes, sizes, and appearances and can come from the asteroid belt, the moon, and even Mars. So meteorites can help scientists answer questions about how our planet and solar system form and change over time. So thank you again for joining us. Grace, take it away. Hi everyone, welcome Hi. to tonight's VEEPS program about space rocks. Um, before we get started, I just wanna quickly cover the features of Zoom webinar. In case you've never joined an event on Zoom webinar before, um, we have a couple different ways of interacting with you. So you've noticed probably that you can't turn on your camera or your microphone, but we still wanna hear from you. We wanna participate with you guys. So the way that you can do that, you can enter any of your comments, your observations, or your questions for our amazing scientists. Those can go into our chat and we'll see them there. We'll read them out, we'll have a discussion. We also have the Q and A feature. So if you have a question that you want answered, you can put it into the Q&A and we can answer it by text or we'll talk about it. Um, if you want to be promoted up to having your camera and your video shown because you'd like to participate like our volunteer Nathaniel, you can put that in the chat and we'll see if we can upgrade you because today we're gonna to be doing an observation of different rocks and so we'd love to have your observations. Um, Additionally, we're gonna be streaming this live on YouTube. The link is shown right now on the slide. If you have any difficulties during Zoom today, you can drop out of the Zoom meeting and you can go watch live on YouTube where you can still put your questions in and we'll make sure that they get answered. Um, cl closed captioning is also available. Uh, so you can enable that in your own Zoom settings if that's something you need. 
and um, we're going to get rolling. I don't have anything else to cover. Thanks for attending. Awesome. So uh, let me ask a, um, a few questions. So in the chat box, would you please put in like your favorite space movie or TV show? Go ahead in the chat box, put your favorite space movie or TV show. Let's see who we have in our audience this evening. Oh, I see one vote for Star Trek. Uh huh. I see Interstellar. Stellar. Mm -hmm. Star Oops. Wars. Star Trek again. Doctor Who. Avengers. Contact. Star Trek again. Space Jam. <laughs> Looking great. <laughs> okay, the thing. Oh, is that a favorite of yours, of yours, Doctor Gore? This is just reminding me of all the space movies I need to go back and rewatch. <laughs> so this is this is my view list for the weekend. Galaxy Quest. Oh, that one's pretty great. Forbidden Planet. Yeah. There's also some ones I need to find. What is a Torah? Is am I pronouncing that right? The Thura is similar to Jumanji, but it's okay. in space. It's like a board game, a space board game, and these two kids play it, and they end up going on these crazy adventures. Oh, okay. Yeah. I feel like we're in Jumanji. <laughs> there is something going on. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'm like you. Like I'm gonna go and like I've screenshot some of these so I can go back and and look at them. Okay, so it's a variety. Passengers, Arrival, Aliens, Apollo 13, Star Wars. Mandalorian, yes. so good. Martian. The Martian. All right. All right, so now that we have, oh, should I stop? <laughs> Never. Hey, no, Karen, go on, go on, go on. But you know what? Thank you guys for participating. We're going to launch our first poll question. And so I'm launching them now. So we want to give you just a few moments to answer the two following up poll questions. Oh, some people have seen a shooting star. I am not amongst the privilege. Wow, that's awesome. And where are meteorites found on land? So we have a couple of votes, only on land, and they can be found anywhere, mm -hmm. definitely in the lead. All right, let's do a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Awesome, so I'm gonna end the polling and I'm gonna share the results. So majority have seen a shooting star, that's incredible. I wasn't expecting that. And then on the second question, they're saying that meteorites can be found anyone, anywhere on Earth. What do you have to say about that, Dr. Gorsh? Take it away. All right. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Awesome. All right. So hopefully we're going to answer both questions in that poll in the next couple of slides. So hello, my name is Dr. Jennifer Gorse. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, my background is in geology, so my specialty is in looking at rocks and using the clues that are preserved in rocks to understand things about our own planet Earth, but also different planetary bodies in the solar system. And I'm going to let um, Elizabeth introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth and I'm an intern this summer at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, but during the school year I'm a student at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland studying geology. So yeah, I'm used to earth rocks, but I've really liked getting to do space rocks this summer. She's been with us for about seven weeks now, so we are sadly coming to the end of that internship, um, but it's been a really fun experience I think for both of us. So we asked how many of you had seen a shooting star and I think about 96% of you have said, yes, I've seen a shooting star. So if you've seen a shooting star, you've actually seen a rock from space. And we call it a meteor when it is passing through the Earth's atmosphere and we see that bright streak of light coming across the sky um, late in the evening once the sun is down. 
Um, you might have heard scientists call it a meteoroid or a meteorite, and you might be asking, well, what is the difference between those three? And the answer is it depends on where that rock is located relative to the Earth. So if that piece of space rock is floating or it's traveling through space and it is not near Earth, we call it a meteoroid. If it is traveling through the atmosphere, we call it a meteorite and or a meteor, my apologies. And if it has landed on Earth and it is on the Earth's surface and you can pick it up, then we call it a meteorite. So it is the same rock, it's just in different locations. All right, so then at this point, you might be wondering where are meteorites found on Earth? So a lot of you guessed correctly that meteorites can be found all over the Earth's surface. They fall everywhere. We can find them on land, definitely, and that's where we usually do find them. But they also do fall in the ocean, all over the place. So the thing with meteorites is they're usually pretty small, although they can be huge and they're dark. So it's easiest to find them on a light colored background like desert sand or snow and ice. So one of the biggest meteorite search and recovery programs is called ANSMET, which stands for the Antarctic um, Search for Meteorites. And every year since 1976, with the exception of the past couple because of COVID, they've gone down there and spent months combing the ice for thousands of meteorites. This is a totally volunteer program, so if any of you are interested someday, you can write a letter. They take volunteer applications via letter, and you have to send it on paper, which is crazy to think. But yeah, you can send them a letter and maybe go down there someday. So meteorites come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and appearances. And that means that they probably come from different places and have gone through different processes. And so for the next few slides, we're just going to show you a couple really beautiful examples of some of the wide variety of meteorites. Um, so these examples in this first slide are actually similar to what Elizabeth is studying right now for her internship. Yeah, so these meteorites here are called chondrites, and they're named after these little round circly blobs you can see in here, which are called chondrules. And they are some really, really, really old rocks. So they formed about 4.6 billion years ago. So 500 million years before the earth, which is about 125 million presidential terms. So if you think about how many presidents we've had so far, multiply that by a lot of zeros. So chondrites are really cool because they can tell us a lot about early solar system history. Now, if we take a bunch of meteors and we have them collide in space and they stick together and they form a bigger and a bigger and a bigger body in space, eventually that body is going to get big enough that it starts to generate a lot of heat. And when you generate a lot of heat, you generate a lot of melt. And melting allows a body to divide itself up into layers. So that is what this image on the left is showing us. And it's a planet that isn't Earth, but looks very similar to Earth. So we have a core, which is our inner layer. We have a middle layer that we call the mantle, and we have an outer layer called a crust. And so this isn't unique to Earth. You also see it on very large asteroids, which are a source of meteorites and other planets. And meteorites that we pick up on Earth, they look a certain way depending on what part of this body they come from. So the pictures you see here are of iron meteorites, which are from the cores of old planetesimals is what we would call this body. And they are a combination of iron and nickel metals that are pretty heavy and pretty dense. Um, and they form these beautiful patterns on their surface because they cool very slowly and they're very, very old. They've had a lot of time to cool down and form these beautiful structures. We also have meteorites from the core mantle boundary. So you can see that in the pink star in the image in the upper right hand corner. And these are called palisites. And these are probably some of my favorite meteorites. They are absolutely gorgeous. And so they have the same metal look for the most part as the iron meteorites on the previous slide, but they also have these massive um, crystals that are kind of a greenish brown color. And that is a crystal called olivine. Um, those of you who are August babies probably have heard it as 
peridot, which is the birthstone of August. So um, that is a mineral that we find in the mantle a lot of times, in the mantles of planetary bodies. And so this is a combination of both the core and the mantle, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Um, I wish I had a sample of this, but I do not. One day when I have a lot of money and can own a museum, this will be, there will be a whole room devoted to this rock sample. So, the... so then the last little group of meteorites we have pictures of here are some that come from the outside of our planetesimal, so the crust. And these meteorites are actually pretty similar in terms of the minerals that compose them and the textures they have to some rocks that we would find on Earth, especially in big volcanic regions like Hawaii or Iceland. So if you've ever been near a volcano and picked up a rock, you know, hopefully not too close to a volcano, but somewhere in the area um, and picked up a rock and looked at it, you might actually think that it looks pretty close to the pictures that we have here on the slides. So those are when we find them on Earth, but where do they come from in our solar system? So we've got a map of our solar system here, the sun at the center, the planets are circling it. We also have the asteroid belt orbiting around the sun. And if I was to take an arrow and point to where do some of these meteorites come from in our solar system, it would look a little like this. So samples like the chondrites, Elizabeth studies, or iron meteorites, or palisites probably come from the asteroid belt, which is a region of space of a lot of rock debris that's left over from the earliest portions of solar system formation. We could point an arrow to the moon, and that's where our lunar meteorites are from. The last meteorite are the shergatites, which are from the crust. Do you, does anyone want to guess, either in the chat or even out loud, um, what planet do you think those shergatites come from? I can't see the chat, but I can see um, I see. So, a I, I hear it. I see Mars and I see Mercury. Okay, so those are both really good guesses because those are both small rocky planets. Shergatite. Everyone says Saturn. Okay, so Saturn. Also, I mean, it's possible. So shergatites actually come from Mars, um, as far as we know. And just to give you a sense of how far shergatites have to travel to get to Earth, you would have to drive on the highway at 70 miles per hour for 67 years without stopping to get from Mars to Earth. Um, now, uh, meteorites get there much faster as do spacecraft that we send to Mars. They get to Mars in about nine months. But if you were to travel at kind of like a normal highway speed, it would take a very, very long time to get to Mars. So meteorites can travel from very, very far reaches of the solar system. Ultimately, we want to study meteorites because they tell us information about our solar system. We can ask questions like, well, how do planets form? How do we go from small bits of rock to slightly larger bits of rock to hot large bits of rock to a planet? We can ask questions like, well, what did our solar system look like a long time ago? So that's where we would study, say, a chondrite, because they are really, really old and tell us about that early part of the solar system. And we can ask questions like, well, why does our solar system look the way it does now? So what evolution or what processes have happened throughout solar system history so that we have four large gas giants and four small rocky bodies? Like, why do they exist and exist where they are? Now, this is all contingent on the fact that we need to be able to identify a meteorite once it gets to our planet. And so the big question is, well, can we tell the difference between a meteorite and a rock from Earth? You know, as Elizabeth said, some of these rocks look very similar to say volcanic rocks that we can find on Earth. And if we can tell the difference, how? Um, so I'll tell you the answer to the first question is yes. And the answer to the second question we've put in a table. So there are certain characteristics that we can observe in a rock that we have in our hand, or in this case, um, we, we might have some examples later to show on screen. And that will help us determine whether we're looking at a meteorite or an earth rock, in this case, what we've called a meteor wrong. 
So if we have a meteorite, a meteorite is typically dark on the outside, and that's because it forms a fusion crust. And a fusion crust happens, um, it is formed when the meteor passes through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets really hot and it melts a little bit on the outside. So everything gets really smooth and dark and shiny. They are heavy, they are really heavy. They are formed from elements like iron, um, which weigh a lot. If you slice them in half, they're typically shiny, like metallic shiny in the middle. They are magnetic. And in the case of a chondrite, you'll see those little sto stony balls, those little round shapes that Elizabeth said were chondrules earlier on. Yep, and then on the other hand, we have our meteor rocks, so our earth rocks. So earth rocks can be bubbly and with holes and they don't have to be round. So like Dr. Gorse was talking about, when a meteorite comes through the Earth's atmosphere, it usually ends up getting kind of rounded by the um, process of traveling through the atmosphere with all the heat. Um, earth rocks can have sparkly crystals or bright crystals. They won't usually have a colored streak. And some earth rocks can be magnetic too, but it's much less common to have them be as strongly magnetic as a meteorite would be. So scientists are constantly looking for new meteorites to answer questions about our solar system. And this is kind of the way if we pick up a rock and we're suspicious, we're, we test this. Um, and with that, I think that's all we have for you guys today. Um, I think we're going to open up the floor to questions. If I'm not completely forgetting the, the itinerary. <laughs> No, thank you, um, Dr. Gorsh and Elizabeth for that information. Awesome presentation. And I have a question for you all, which um, which she mentioned, but I'm going to just see if you were paying attention. So I'm going to launch the next poll question, which is it impossible? Is it impossible to tell the difference between an earth rock and a meteorite? Is it impossible to tell the difference? Go ahead. Do -do 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 -do. All right. Is it impossible to tell the difference between an earth rock and a meteorite in five, four, three, two, one? Ding, 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 ding. All right. I hear see some last people, some, some last votes came in. So um, we have about 26 or 24 people said false. 24 people said false. It false. What do you say, Dr. Gorsh? I would say it is false. It is not impossible. It can be very difficult sometimes. Um, and I have had friends pick up samples that they're like, oh, can you look at this? And it is magnetic. It is metallic. Um, and then it's it ends up being something maybe industrial. And you have to do some extra tests to confirm that in that case. But it is not impossible to tell the difference between a meteorite and an earth rock. Right. Well, we're going to go ahead and go to the Q&A. And so there is a question from Andrea. And thank you for giving your question. So Andrea adds, what makes a meteorite magnetic? Oh, that's a great question. So meteorites are magnetic because they have a lot of iron in them. And so iron is a magnetic element and meteorites for an iron meteorite, it can be mostly made of iron. Um, so it's very magnetic. And then something like um, like some of the samples Elizabeth study or I study, they can have, you know, 30, 20% iron in them. So they, it's, it's the iron that usually makes them magnetic. Awesome. And so a question from Tara states, um, what types of earth rocks can be magnetic? Ooh, that's a great question. So earth rocks, typically they also are rocks that contain a lot of iron in them. And I can by no means give you a comprehensive list because there's over 4,000 minerals on our planet. Um, and it's hard to remember 4,000 minerals. I think I remember 40 on a good day. But typically, um, rocks that contain minerals such as magnetite, which is iron, um, oxide, or ilmenite might be magnetic. So, so iron bearing, again. Um, but if you've if you've ever gone into a rock shop and you've picked up like the the magnetic minerals, they're usually magnetite, um, and they're named for their magnetic properties. 
All righty. And so I am answering and thank you, Karen, for putting your question in the chat. Um, does LPI have any samples at this time? No, and I'm actually writing that. So we do not currently loan out media rights at this time, but there is a Star Lab that is coming up. We're not loaning out it right now. So um, please email me though. Um, I would definitely keep you posted on the loan program from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, Bill asks, have you ever been to Antarctica to search? No, I wish. That's on my bucket list. Elizabeth? I haven't either, but my advisor at college is actually one of the leaders of the program. So maybe I'll write a letter and in a long time after I go to school for many more years, maybe I'll get to go. Right, bucket list. I heard you loud and clear. Um, Bob writes, are stony meteorites magnetic? So not all stony meteorites, again, that's a great question. Not all stony meteorites are necessarily magnetic because at that point, they are made up of minerals that aren't necessarily iron rich um, and therefore have no magnetic properties. So it's not... I would never say, oh, it's magnetic, therefore it is a meteorite. I would say, oh, if it's magnetic, there is a higher possibility of it being a meteorite. Um, the other tests we do that maybe you can't visually see, we do a lot of tests in terms of the chemistry at that point to determine whether it's a meteorite or not. Okay, awesome. And guess what? We got a question from YouTube. Thank you, YouTube, for tuning in and welcome to our Space Rocks event. His question is, what kind of object caused the Tunguski? I am a Tunguski <laughs> event. Um, Are you familiar with that? I am not phenomenon? that event. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to say I'm not familiar with that event. Um, but I'm looking it up now, and yeah, the Tunguska event uh, was the one that caused the fireball over Russia that oh. blew down all the trees in the the early nineteenth nineteen hundreds. My understanding of that event was that it was it was an, a meteor. It came through the atmosphere, but it exploded before it hit the ground, I believe. <clears throat> so it didn't create an impact crater, but it did create a large uh, shock wave. Okay. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so someone in the chat is confirming um, that it did explode above the ground. There's a great Wikipedia entry on it. <laughs> so if you wanna learn more, there's, it's a, uh, I've heard of the name. Um, I think it's probably been covered very well. So. Fortunately, events like that are rare and far between. It actually doesn't take a sample. Um, if a meteor is passing through the atmosphere and you see that bright streak of light, it doesn't have to be any bigger than uh, your pinky nail. Um, so typically meteor strikes are much smaller than that, fortunately, or we would be in much more trouble. So I see a question that maybe got buried a little in the chat from Sue that asked, what causes iridium? which is a really interesting question. So iridium, for, for those who maybe haven't heard of it, is an element on the periodic table. And iridium is very rare on Earth. We don't have it in large abundancies, but it is much more common in meteorites. And iridium is important because a lot of it came with the meteorite that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs at 65 million years ago. And so we look for iridium as a marker of, of a meteorite impact. Um, it's, it's a way to determine whether or not you have an impact event that has occurred on Earth that's been recorded. But it, it's brought in from, from other, other things. It's brought in from outer space. It's not something that we find on Earth very easily. It's there, but it's very, very rare. Okay, that's definitely interesting. Um, so we have a question, what is the largest meteorite scientist has ever found? Ooh. Ooh. I, I think it was, I think it fell in Namibia um, and it was like between 50 and 60 tons. I'm not sure 
if anyone else here knows the name. If you know the name of the fall, put it in the chat. But I know it was around 60 tons. Hoba meteorite. That's it, Grace. Thank you. I just looked it up. <laughs> that one fell uh, fell a long time ago. Um, and it's so big, it's never been moved. It's still in Namib Namibia. It's a tourist attraction. You can go see it, but it stays where it fell. <laughs> That's awesome. This is an interesting question because um, we were actually talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Can scientists predict when a meteor might be headed towards Earth and then go looking for it? Yes and no. So prediction for geology period is, is a challenging prospect. Um, there's a lot of variables that go into predictive tools. But scientists, especially planetary scientists, do have the ability to track a meteorite's trajectory when it is falling to Earth and figure out where it's falling um, and landing. And actually those, we call those meteorite falls, and those are really valuable to scientists because it means that we can collect them immediately before they're contaminated by Earth materials. Um, so those are actually really, really valuable in terms of scientific inquiry. All right, and last question before we get into our game, and this is for Nathaniel, Madison, and Preston. So last question before we go there. So where is the best place for attendees to look for meteorites? Ooh, oh, that is a, <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer for that. Um, because a lot of places are, are relatively inaccessible unless you have the right means to get there. So, so yes, we do find many of our meteorites in Antarctica um, at the South Pole or in the desert, but an average person doesn't necessarily have the ability to go to Antarctica and look there um, or go to the desert and look there. That takes a certain skill set and a certain support system to do that. Um, and so barring that, I don't necessarily know off the top of my head where one would go for that. But I know there are communities of meteorite hunters out there. And with the internet, you can definitely find those. You know, that's what I was thinking. I was just like, well, we can't get to our remote places, but we do <laughs> know people that sell them. So <laughs> they can be purchased. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. I think that it's time to begin our game. Yay. Peter Ely had a question as well. Oh, okay. We definitely want, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, um, Dr. Ely, go ahead and ask your question. You want to come off mute? Oh, I see it in the chat. I'm sorry. It, he says, how does the meteorite get in the atmosphere? Oh, okay. That's a great question. So the meteorite is traveling very, very fast. So it has a lot of energy and it is able to, to penetrate the atmosphere. So our atmosphere is gas, so you can pass objects through it. And the further away from Earth, the less dense the atmosphere. So it's probably easier at the top of the atmosphere than the bottom of the atmosphere. So it's a combination of having a lot of speed and a lot of energy and happening to travel in the right direction at the right time to intersect Earth's atmosphere. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Dr. Gorsh, let's take us away. And thank you, Mr. Bill, for putting that information in the chat box. He said the Big Rock Show, New Houston in August, where you can purchase meteorites. So thank you for that. That plug. All right. So we are actually going to do a bit of an exercise. Well, exercises. It's a fun game. We have a couple rock samples that we've uh, collected or have been given, and we want to figure out whether they are a meteorite or a meteor wrong. And so Sherelle has them nicely laid out right here in front of us. We've got samples one, two, three, four, or five. And so what we're going to do is we are going to use our skills of observation, what we can see, um, and we're going to ask Sherelle to, to pick the samples up and to look at them closer under the camera. And we are going to determine which samples are meteorites and which ones are meteor wrongs. And so to start that off, we're going to take a sample one. Sherelle, would you mind bringing that one closer to the camera? I'm just going to take a few moments to go ahead and look at it. 
look at the color, maybe look at whether you see bits of rock in it or holes. Look at the shape. And can we launch our poll question? Yes, please do so. So we're going to launch, uh, ask you guys to answer a few questions in a poll um, to narrow down your observations. So for sample one, I want you to check all of the things that apply to sample one. So is it dark colored? Is it light colored? Does it have a lot of little holes or have no holes? Um, is it magnetic? or not magnetic. And Shirelle is testing it with a magnet right now. And the rock is not picking up the magnet. Give you guys a few more moments. If you want to um, put your observations in the chat, feel free to do so as well. And what have people said about this rock? All right. So most people said it was light colored and not magnetic. And then we have a bit of a split on whether it has a lot of little holes or it has no holes. Um, so this is, this would be easier if we could hold the sample in our hand. Sherelle, does it look like it has a lot of holes? So no, I see where there are like craters in it, but there's not any, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of holes. Okay. So what might be happening is I know there's lots of little pieces of rock in there that are a little darker and they might look a lot like holes. Um, but in general, this is probably not a super holy rock. Um, so yeah, right now we seem to think that it's light colored, there's not a lot of holes and it's not magnetic. Uh, so keep that in the back of your mind because at the end of uh, looking at all of these samples, we're gonna ask you which two, so there are two meteorites out of the five samples. So we'll ask you which two you think are the meteorites. So sample number two, thank you, Sherelle. So question to our, to our participating families, is it light colored or is it dark colored? And you guys can come off of mute if you like, Nathaniel, Madison, Preston. It's dark colored. It's dark colored. I see a couple people saying dark in the chat as well. Does it look like it has a lot of holes? Not really. Not really. What about the shape? Do you think it's smooth? Do you think it's not smooth? Do you think it's sharp? What do you think? It's I think when I touch it, it might be not smooth because it might be a little um, spot rocky. Okay, so if you touch it, it might not be super, super smooth. But um, Sherelle, what do you say when you touch it? Is it smooth or is it is it rough? Um, No, it's actually quite pretty. It's actually smooth. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty smooth compared to the other one. All right. Compared to the other one, it's definitely smooth. Um, yeah. What about the magnet? Does it pick up the magnet? Actually, it does. Okay. So unlike number one, number two seems to be pretty dark. It's smooth. It doesn't have holes and it picks up the magnet. Check, check, and check. What about number three? What is something that's different about this one from number two? It's not smooth. It's not smooth, so it's definitely much rougher. Sherelle, does it feel rougher? Yes, it does. Okay. 
it look, it got some holes in it, but I don't think I don't know if it would work for the magnet. Okay, so you see holes. Does it work on the magnet? It no, does. does it? Okay, so the only thing this one has going for it is that it's dark. Oh, I've got a question in chat. How heavy does it feel, Sherelle? This one is actually pretty light. Like I can toss it up and down right here. It's pretty light. Okay, and that might be because it does have holes in it. So it's got a lot of air space in it. And someone is asking, is that mean it's volcanic? It could be. So, so holes can be a sign that we have a volcanic rock. Oh, that's a great observation. Yeah, that's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful observation. Yeah. Mm hmm all right, what about number four? What do we notice? Between one, two, and three, which one does four look like the most right now? It got no holes in it, and it looks pretty smooth. Yes, I agree. It definitely has no holes, and it looks pretty smooth. So which one is that the most similar like? I see a couple people have said number two in the chat. Do you guys agree? Does it look like number one? Oh. Uh, it's a, oh. um, it, they don't look the same, but they the one, the other one, it has the dark color and the other kind of looks like a light shady color. And okay. then, they, they're both smooth and they have no holes in it. Okay, so we've got at least two that are smooth with no holes. One that's rough with holes and dark. Is number four magnetic, Sherelle? Let's see. Ooh. It's definitely. It definitely does. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it is your right, Madison. It's definitely picking it up. Do y'all see that? It's picking it up? Yeah. It's Asking, is it magnetic? I think that's pretty safely magnetic. Yes. So, so far, just to recap, which two samples are magnetic right now? Oh, the, the smooth ones without no holes. Yeah, the smooth ones without holes. Let's test number five, just to be sure. Oops. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. It might have, it has some holes in it, and mm -hmm. it, it looks rough to me. It looks like a rough. Yeah, it looks It is rough, rough, actually. So I don't know about you guys, I think that's the sparkliest rock we've seen yet. Like, that's pretty sparkly. I like sparkles. Um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> my mother likes to call me a crow sometimes because I'm attracted to all sorts of sparkly jewelry at all times. <laughs> it's it's like the, if you've seen the secret of nim she she likes to it's like that type of crow jerelle we want to know if this one is heavy yes it actually is that's why i'm holding this one with two hands instead of one mm -hmm. and is it and we already tested remind me is it magnetic guys it's oh, no no no. No, definitely not magnetic. Oh, we've got a great question here. Wonder if a water displacement experiment would add to the data here. Karen, that's a wonderful question. Yes, so a water displacement experiment, for those who haven't heard of it, is you have a bucket of water and you measure the level of the water, you put the rock in, and then you measure the new level of the water. And that tells you what is the volume of the rock. And so if you know the volume of the rock and you know the weight of the rock, how much it weighs, you can calculate how dense the rock is. And density is important because meteorites are usually very dense rocks. So they have a lot of material packed into a small space. Uh, we're not gonna do that right now, um, just because it can be a little messy, but that's definitely an experiment we could conduct if we wanted to test the density of our meteorites or meteor wrongs. We're also being asked, um, it also could confirm whether any bubbles are inside, which is true. So if it was really, really light, 
the the rock could actually float on the rock on the on the on the water. water. YouTuber Chris Hogan Micah in that one. Yes, Micah. Oh, so I'm assuming you're referring to number five, which is the really sparkly one. Um, that is possible. I do not have this rock in hand and I haven't held it in hand for a while. So off the top of my head, I do not know. But it does have a lot of the characteristics of mica, which is a very flaky mineral that's shiny. It's kind of plasticky. Um, and it goes into a lot of makeup products, actually. It's the sparkles in makeup products. Oh, shut up. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I saw this one recently, I believe because it's so dense, mm -hmm. it isn't the mica. I think it's either pyroxene or amphibole. Mm, Chris, okay. if you're familiar with those, I think that's, it's, those can also be dark and shiny um, and they tend to be heavier too. This sample's quite heavy. Someone is asking, is number two heavy? Um, it's not as heavy as this one, mm -hmm. but I feel as though if they were the same size, that this one would definitely be heavier than this one. Okay, so it's pretty heavy for its size. Yeah, it's pretty heavy for its size. Okay. All right. Well, well, hey, Grace. I was gonna say, do people? We're gonna we're gonna launch a poll that will allow you to vote on which ones you think are meteorites. Do people feel ready to do the poll or do you have more observations you wanna make of the samples? Are you pretty confident? Thumbs up if you're pretty confident to know which one are what. All right. I feel good. good. Okay. All right, in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so a lot of votes for sample two, a few votes for sample one. No one believes sample three is a meteorite. A lot of votes for sample four and a couple of votes for sample six. So the answer are two and four are the meteorites. And some of the observations you guys made were really, really great, which eliminates the other samples. So I think a lot of people said number two and number four were smooth. They're pretty dark, at least compared to some of the other samples. Sherelle said that they are heavy. They are magnetic. Um, what else? And they don't have any bubbles. They don't have any holes in them. So that points, all the evidence points to those two being meteorites. Um, no one said number three, which, um, what, what made you eliminate number three? Why do you not think it's a meteorite? See bubbles in the chat, yeah. anything? It's not magnetic. It's not magnetic. So yeah. Because the bubble, because the holes, it won't stick to the, grab the magnet. Yeah, it won't grab the magnet, definitely. So um, a couple of people have actually said they think that one is volcanic. Um, and that's probably very likely. It's, it's from a volcano on earth, which as Elizabeth said earlier, they can look suspiciously like meteorites sometimes. And then a few people said number one, um, so number one is very, very light colored, which is not a typical characteristic of meteorites and it's not magnetic. Um, and actually I think number one is a piece of concrete. So that's kind of the sneaky <laughs> that we stuck in there to kind of trick you guys. It was kind of the red herring in the group. And then number five is also really tricky because it is dark, it is heavy. 
but, and I think a couple of people have said this in the tract, it's sparkly, which is not uh, a characteristic of meteorites. And Karen, I, I love what you said in the chat actually, which is that it couldn't have survived entry into the atmosphere. So those sparkles probably wouldn't, they, they get destroyed. Um, and I think a couple of people had said that there were a few small bubbles in number five as well. So that one's a pretty tricky sample um, because it is so dark and heavy, but uh, the sparkles and the bubbles make us think they're probably not meteorites. Do people have any questions on those samples? Do you wanna learn more about them? In the future, do you think you can identify a meteorite? If someone gave you a rock and asked you, do you think this is a meteorite? Nathan, you say yes. Okay. Are you Madison and Preston? Could you identify a meteorite with your naked eye? Yes, we did. Nice. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> awesome. Ooh, we just got a really good question from the chat, which says, water can make rocks pretty smooth too over thousands of years. How would you distinguish the smoothness created by atmosphere versus water on Earth? And that is a great question. Um, and the answer is if you just said, is it smooth, yes or no, does that mean it's a meteorite, yes or no? That would be a very difficult thing to do because you're right, both, both processes are basically erosion. So they're smoothing down the surface of that sample and we would have to use multiple observations to say, well, this smoothness was created by the atmosphere versus this smoothness was created by water. So we would have to look at the magnets, we'd have to look at the color, We'd have to look at the minerals that are inside the rock. Um, and if all of that doesn't work, we can look at the chemistry and the elements that make up the rocks as well. I mean, that's a great question. Well, all right, we are going to go to our next. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all for your participation in our activity. We also want to thank our host families for your observations. So we have one final, and Mr. Bill, I absolutely think that I'm going to take you up on your offer, so you just hold tight. Um, we're going to launch our last and final poll question. And in the meantime, Mr. Bill, I'm going to promote you, please, and thank you, so we can see your collection. Uh, perhaps you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, we can. OK. So I, I can show you the meteorites if I can, I guess. If Unmute? You can. Unmute your camera? Oh, well, uh, I don't have the option in the lower left-hand corner right now. Okay. What about now? And before you get started, Mr. Bill, again, thank you everyone for participating in the poll questions. I'm going to go ahead and screenshot those so I can have them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and end polling, polling in five, four, three, two, one. All right, Mr. Bill. We're ready when you are. I'm going to go ahead and ping you now. Okay. I have a small collection of meteorites. I go to schools and talk to kids about them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'll try to get through these really quick. Okay. okay. This is an iron meteorite. I'm trying to do this correctly in the camera. Uh, very heavy. It has the dark fusion crust. Okay. It's actually a piece of the meteorite that made Meteor Crater there in Arizona 50,000 years ago. Okay. Oops. There we go. Okay. All right. 
And so it's an iron meteorite. You can't tell, but it's uh, heavy for its size. All right. And it is kind of typical for the iron meteorites. And then, of course, as you already showed earlier, one of the geologist ladies, this is a, 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 a let's see, I'll put some light on this maybe. Here we go. Uh, That's gorgeous. So a slice of an iron meteorite where you can see the lines after they treat it with acid, all right? And then when you see this, you know you got a space rock, that's for sure, this one, okay? So here's the other side here. Um, you can see the lines like, like you showed earlier. Okay, fine. Uh, so that's iron. Uh, over here is something I picked up at that rock show that's uh, near Houston. I picked it up a couple of years ago and I'm trying to get the, it's hard to see this here, but this guy is mostly a stony meteorite and I'm trying to light it up, but it's not really showing. It has a few little flecks of iron in it, a very small amount of iron. And if you see it up close, you can, I, guess, I don't think the light is showing the uh, iron very well, but anyway, so it's a combination of the stony and, and iron. Uh, you, you showed the, the cronules. Now, most notably how small this doggone thing is, because the ones with the cronules are, uh, what do they call that? Expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, I don't know if you can see it. It's very small, and it, but it has some of the cronules in it. The little small round uh, pebbles that, you know, are, come from the early solar system formation. And, uh, oh, maybe... Oh, oh, here's, um, this is an ordinary stony meteorite. You might find this interesting though. If you look at the, it's got the fusion, the dark fusion crust, right? And the shape, it is believed, is the way it is. See how rounded it is? It reminds me of the nose of the space shuttle because as it was falling through the atmosphere and heating up and the surface is melting and causing that fusion crust, it uh, gets shaped by the pressure of the air. And so they call that, uh, they say it's oriented. Uh, so the, the heat and the pressure of the air is enough to actually shape the surface of the, of the rock there, okay? Um, oh, oh yeah, you mentioned the palisites. Okay, this is the last one. I'll be done soon, okay? So the palisites are the ones that, come, I'm trying to do this with the camera, that are, are uh, from the border of the mantle and the core. So you have a mixture, mixture of the iron and those uh, olivine crystals. And I'll see when I put the light behind it, I'm sorry, this, you can see the light shining through a couple of the crystals there. And if you put the light in front of it, you might be able to see the silver iron. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, uh, I don't know how well this is showing up. Uh, yeah, no, that looks you know, beautiful. It's not a cinematography event here. Um, anyway, so that's a palisite. It's also small because that's expensive too. Anyway, uh, I have others which, oh, uh, you might have heard that there was a big, uh, this doesn't matter, there, there was a big um, uh, meteor explosion in Russia. Holy mackerel, 2013? Time flies. And this is a little piece, oh, so small it fell out of my box. This is a little piece of the meteor. I have it on good authority that this is a piece of the meteor that exploded off over Chelyabinsk. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was 2013. Anyway, I come from, more of these come from a, a collector of mine a collector friend of mine who has so many of them that it's a sin. Okay. He, he just, he has, he, he can't help himself anyway. Um, that's more or less what I got. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think you, you have a phenomenal collection and I know that so many of us are jealous about your collection. So thank you for even showing this. Um, uh, the last thing, the last thing I will say is that rock show that I mentioned in early August, I think, it's, uh -huh. uh, it's down there uh, east of Houston uh, at, a, at a big uh, place, a big- uh, Georgia like, Brown Convention Center? Maybe like a convention center. I think it might be in, uh, um, I forget. Anyway, look it up, rock show Houston in August. And, and that's why I got some of these. Some of them I got from my collector, collector friend, but some you can get some nice stuff there at reasonable prices. Well, awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the information. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank awesome. You. And thank you again, Dr. Gorse and Elizabeth Heine for presenting Space Rock tonight. You both did a phenomenal job. And I cannot end this presentation without saying thank you to our host family, Madison, Preston, and Dr. Ely, as well as Nut, thank you.
thank you. Give yourself a round of applause. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you, my partner in crime, Grace, for all that you do, as well as Ms. Yolanda. Thank you again for being here and supporting us. Um, Grace has put a number of links in the chat box. If you would like to be a part of our future events, get notifications, please sign up for our newsletter. Again, my name is Sherelle Webb, and we will be so thrilled for you to join us in the future. You guys have a phenomenal night, and see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye, Mr. Rowe. Bye. Bye, Madison. Bye, Preston. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ely, for our gifts. Bye, Nathan. You did an awesome Bye. job. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We still have some attendees. Oh, it's it's rolling. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Elizabeth left us. She was like, you know what? You said goodnight. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs>